Hello and thank you for joining us no matter where you are in the world and welcome to Huawei Industrial Digital Transformation Conference 2021. The restrictions placed on movement over the last year in an effort to suppress the spread of COVID-19 have shone a light on the critical role that the global logistics sector has to play. And today we're going to explore together how digital transformation elevates ports development into the next generation. Let's begin by handing over to Dolores Ordonez, Technical Director of Spanish Smart Logistics Provider Any Solutions to find out how smart and sustainable ports enabled through the Internet of Things and Big Data Analytics shape the future of logistics. Good morning or good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Huawei for the invitation to participate in this Industrial Digital Transformation event and a special thanks to Jing Thang for her kind invitation. My name is Dolores Ordóñez, I am representing Any Solution, an innovative company that is located in Mallorca, a Balearic Island, Spain. Today I am going to speak about the smart and sustainable ports, a bit for the future. And I have structured the presentation in different building blocks, starting with the one related to energy. Because we are considering that the introduction of energy efficiency measures together with the uses of the new and clean energies would be fundamental to support this transformation of the ports into uh, more uh, sustainable and smarter ports. And we have already some examples. Uh, we have the Green Highland Project, which is a very challenging project in which the green hydrogen that is produced in the island of Mallorca with renewables is going to be used to different activities in the port area. There is another pro project that is called uh, Clean Port that promotes the use of uh, LNG in the ports in order to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are being used by the vessels and therefore also reducing the emissions that are produced. And we have to take into account also the importance of the uh, photovoltaics because the, in the ports we find uh, a large number of terminals in which uh, we can install in the roofs uh, these photovoltaic panels that can be used either for self-consumption but also for different users and, and we are working in different possibilities also for the salinization of water and uh, uh, other purposes as could be also the one related to uh, charging cars. Because um, we know that uh, the ports now are working towards these almost zero emissions and it is important to have an overall view, uh, view of all the possible actions that could be implemented in the port area. Uh, the ports used to have a quite a large surface and this means that the mobility along this surface is being done normally with traditional vehicles. But it is important to see also that the tendency is that in, in most of the ports the introduction of the hybrids but also full electric vehicles is every time bigger. And th this should be supported by infrastructure. Infrastructure is also key in this part to achieve this uh, zero emissions port. Because we need uh, this uh, charging point for the electrical vehicles that are uh, being supplied with renewables, perhaps with uh, photovoltaics that are installed in the terminal building, but also in some parking areas. And then we have the part of the vessels. And one of the problems we found is the huge amount of emissions that the vessels are producing when they arrive to the ports, uh, because when they are staying there, they have the motors on and they are producing a lot of emissions. Uh, in order to reduce it and, and to be able to, to stop the motors, it is important to offer the needed infrastructure to connect the vessels to, to the port. And also, the next step is that this energy that is, that is provided to the vessel will be also renewable, either from photovoltaic but also, for example, with, with green hydrogen. And other important area is uh, when we are generating all these kind of infrastructures in the port, say, taking into account that exist a lot of buildings and actions that are being implemented, we have to think of the new materials. Nowadays there are a large research in the different materials that are contributing very much in reducing the, the, the emissions and should be taken into account if we really want to achieve these zero emission ports. Another important building block is related to the seamless and highly efficient logistic operation. We have to take into account 
that the port is a lively ecosystem in which different actors, different stakeholders, public and private entities are working together, perhaps with different objectives, but at, but at the same time with the same aim to be more sustainable and to reduce emissions. And this will be only possible if they are all connected. For that, it is important to have these uh, common dashboards, but uh, the, the back office is based in the amount of data that they are generating and they should be able to share. This is a, a key point in which uh, uh, we can start discussing a lot about that, but uh, this, um, it is demonstrated that when we are able to share all our data in this ecosystem, we are going to be able to be more efficient. So it is important also to generate this kind of uh, discussions on the data sovereignty and how are we going to increase efficiencies in the port. One example, for example, it is directly related to the arrival of the passengers uh, uh, in a port. So we need to know exactly when the, this arrival is produced to link it directly with other activities, with shops, with the public and private transport, and a lot of things that are directly linked with that. And at the same time to know which is the time that this vessel is going to be in the port in order to organize the arrival of the next one. And as, as much information as we are able to uh, share, as much efficient that we will uh, achieve. Of course, the magic word now is interoperability, because we have and we know that there, we, there exists already a lot of uh, digital solutions in the port, but some of them are not interoperable. So we really need to start working in these APIs that will allow the interoperability of the existing solutions. And this is completely linked to the next point, which is related to this digitalization towards uh, this uh, smart port. And we have to think also that the port could be a strategic lab to test new solutions. We are seeing that now with the autonomous vehicle, that is something that everybody is speaking about, but we have also these drones, and for example, we have one that is cleaning the, the surface with all the litter that we, 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 we found, uh, regrettably, in, in our seas. But we can go a step further. There are a lot of robots that are uh, being thought to be implemented in the ports. There are uh, different uh, autonomous vehicles that could be introduced in the port areas. And for that, we will need connectivity. And for that, I think Huawei, with all the developments they are implemented in 5G and 6G, could be also a key actor to, to allow the, the fastest deployment of, of this solution. Another important area, and also linked with that, is multimodality. Because at the end, we see that the port is a hub of operation, and we are seeing that not all the ports are linked directly to uh, public transport, to uh, railways, or directly to the airport, depending on the port. There are a lot of uh, possibilities. And it is important also to think in which is the relation among the port and the city. For example, in our island, the main port is directly uh, included in, in, the, in the city ecosystem. And this means that the relation among the city and the port should be as smooth, uh, as, smooth as possible. The municipality and the port authority of our island, they are working already in, in different solutions. One, for example, is this Welcome Palma. This was a solution that at the beginning, it was only thought for the cruises. Because in, in, in a specific moments, a huge amount of people is arriving to the island and they used to go to the same places. This generates a lot of crowds, as you can imagine now, in this uh, uh, pandemic situation with the COVID-19, everybody is trying to avoid these, these crowds. But it was also when they started a matter of increase the satisfaction of the people, trying to reduce the queues and to know also how the, the people was moving around generating these heat maps. Now, this solution is used also for, this, uh, for all the tourists and it's based in recommendations. So the tourists will know exactly the time it will take to, to arrive to a monument, but also if they will have to queue or not. And then it's also linked with the public transport, offering a seamless connectivity and also a possibility to enjoy uh, the, the, the city as much as they can, linking with the port authority. But at the same time, and I don't know uh, in, in other countries, but in Spain, the port authority used to be 
uh, a public authority. And this means that they have these uh, regulatory uh, mechanisms because they are the ones that are in charge of managing uh, all the port area. But at the same time, they can use these mechanisms to incentivize sustainability. And this is key because there are some examples that show that, for example, by reducing uh, some of the port uh, taxes, uh, incentivizing that if you are more sustainable or you have introduced some sustainability in your products, services uh, or so on, I will reduce you the port tax and with the amount that I am reducing to you, you are going to use it, this uh, uh, amount of money to increase the sustainability of your new products or service, you are increasing dramatically the sustainability in the port area. And this is very important and this is key. And this is something that all the ports could uh, figure out, how could increase the sustainability of their ports by engaging, involving the, 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 port, the port ecosystem. Also, there are different uh, possibilities to work with all the ecosystem. In Spain, we had this call of Ports uh, 4.0, in which the port authorities were working with the SMEs and the startups to acting as a, as a living labs, as, as laboratories in which the SMEs could test their solutions. So it has been also a very nice initiative in which we saw how the interaction among the public entity with the, with the private ecosystem has worked uh, very well. This, at the end, is increasing the competitiveness not only of the companies that are testing their solutions in the port, but is it also increasing the, com the competitiveness of the own port because it's more innovative, it's generating a lively and innovative ecosystem that is generating more uh, economic growth. And this is also very important to take into account because at the end they are generating wealth. And they are generating, when they are generating wealth, they are also generating a uh, highest quality of, of life. And we have to think that we are working in a complex environment because there are a huge amount of actors that are working in the port area, uh, the big companies, uh, small companies, startups, uh, public entities, NGOs, uh, university research centers, and so on. So uh, it is very important to have a clear governance in the port area. For example, in the in, in the in the Baleares, the port authority has generated uh, different dynamics in which they are uh, working together with the different actors that are part of this. Uh, uh, port ecosystem in order to know exactly which are uh, their requirements and how can they work together to achieve this uh, digitalization and also this sustainability uh, in the port. And this has been very, very su successful and they are in, in, um, developing some common projects together. Another important area is sustainability. Because sustainability is a key driver. So we are speaking about digitalization, a smart and sustainable port. And when we are thinking or we are speaking about sustainability, we have to think in this economic, social and environmental sustainability. For example, ports are uh, big uh, waste uh, producers. And we are implementing now a pilot in the island of Mallorca and it is called a zero waste port. What we are doing is to try to understand the, uh, the waste that is produced, where it's produced, uh, how it's produced, where it's produced, and which is the typology of waste that is produced, and also to try to transfer all this waste either in raw material or in new materials. And this is quite successful because it is not just a matter to work uh, with the waste producers, but at the same time we are generating an awareness of all the people that we engage in this, in this pilot. It is also very important to measure and to know exactly which is the pollution that is being produced in the air quality, in noise and so on. And therefore, at, along the, the port, we, have, we are installing different uh, sensors. We have already installed a network of sensors that are bringing us information. And also we are trying to connect the amount of uh, uh, pollution with some events that are producing in the port. So we can know exactly how this pollution has been, has been produced, when, and perhaps also uh, from whom. Uh, another important thing is water. So in, in, in ports, water is a, a key issue because it's part of the, of the main area of the, of the port. 
and should be cared and, and protected. So there are different solutions and also uh, because we are living in an island, for us it is important everything related to the drinking water. When the big crisis arrived to the, um, to the port, they are asking to be supplied with a huge amount of drinking water. This means that for an island that we, we are always lacking of drinking water, this could be a problem, especially in, in summer season. So that's why we are thinking in generating this desalinization plant that will be fed up with uh, uh, renewable energies. And therefore, we are not going to consume the water that is being provided for, for the tourists and also for the citizens that are uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, but also we have to take care about the quality of the water. And there are a lot of initiatives to measure which are the levels of pollution of the water. You have seen before that we are using these drones to clean the water surface. But also we, we want to know which is the, the levels of pollution that there are in different positions uh, in all the bay that is linked with the, with the port area. And this, this is why we are working also with the smart voice and to get as much as information as, as possible. And then, uh, finally, it is important uh, to link it with the first slide we mentioned at the beginning, with energy, because at the end we are speaking about different kind of circularities at the level of, uh, uh, of the port, and it is important to put them together. Of course, uh, we are also in this uh, digital port, and all the data that we are generating with uh, uh, air quality, water quality, with energy, with waste, are together in the same platform. So we can start measuring and comparing which are the advances and which are the, also the weak points that we have at the port area. And now we want to make it happen. And to make it happen, uh, we were uh, working in a very interesting proposal that we, we have submitted to the uh, Green Deal call. Uh, and we are waiting for the results to be uh, sent out in, in, in June in which uh, Huawei is our, one of the main collaboration, not only in this part uh, related to the uh, um, lithium batteries, but also perhaps by the knowledge that Huawei can bring to the consortium in terms of connectivity, digital transformation, and all the solutions in which uh, we were uh, speaking before. So uh, we are waiting for these results and, and we are crossing fingers uh, to start a fruitful collaboration also co co with Huawei in this field. And this is all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, here you have all my contact details, my social networks. Uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. The bustling mega city of Shanghai is home to the world's largest port in terms of volume. No surprise then that the Shanghai International Port Group's digital transformation is well underway. What pace is it setting and what prospects does it see ahead? Let's turn to SIPG's Huang Heng to find out. In the 21st century, information technologies have been rapidly developed and applied around the world. Driven by emerging technologies such as the Internet, blockchain, big data, and artificial intelligence, industrial digitalization of ports has become inevitable. Smart digital technologies are currently being used to upgrade port operations. They are increasing the capacity and efficiency for partners, improving convenience for customers, and making ports around the world more competitive. On July 25, 2019, China's Ministry of Transport issued an outline for a digital transportation development plan, which will build a digital collection system, grid-based transmission system, and intelligent application system connected by data link to accelerate the development of digital networked and intelligent transportation information. Ultimately, this plan is intended to support China's ambition of becoming a transportation powerhouse. The what is digitalization? Different industry leaders have all given different definitions for digital transformation. The Kinsey and Company breaks down digital transformation into six building blocks, strategy and innovation, the customer decision, journey, process automation, organization, technology, and data and analytics. 
IDC, a leader in market research, has defined digital transformation as the approach organizations take to drive changes in their business models and business ecosystems by leveraging digital technologies, leadership, comprehensive experience, information and data, operating models and talent development are the five areas that are regularly cited as what needs to change to achieve digital transformation. Huawei's vision for digital transformation uses next generation digital technologies to build an all scenario digital world world where all things are connected, all things are sensing, and all things are intelligent. Huawei proposes using optimization and re-engineering to achieve the innovations and restructurings of traditional management and business models needed to achieve business success. Despite a number of different takes on this topic, most agree that digital transformation is centered on business transformation and technology will be the cornerstone in this process. Digital transformation aims to change how companies run their business and to innovate business models. The ultimate goal of this process is to improve quality and efficiency and achieve rapid growth. Take, for instance, water transportation, an industry that is traditionally very labor and capital intensive. It is under enormous pressure to undergo digital transformation. But how do we make water transportation and ports go digital? Let's look at some of the major changes ports face in terms of development and competition. Ports are used to build container terminals and their operations are then centered around using those resources. Now with all these resources in place, how are you going to use them effectively? As you move from controlling resources to managing them, the first question you get is how efficiently can you use the different resources at a port? Second, ports have so far been mainly interested in their internal business, optimizing the internal processes and improving internal efficiency is the first step. But the next step is to look outward. So after adapting internal processes, you then adapt to customer demand. That means providing customers with considerate, personalized, and even butler-style services. In the past, port operators were relatively solitary companies that only cared about their internal operations. But the industry doesn't work like this anymore. Development now relies on other businesses, both upstream and downstream. Expanding ecosystems has been accepted as a new norm. Competition in the future will no longer be between companies but between ecosystems. These are three major trends. How do we at SIPG take advantage of digitalization to grow our business? Our strategy can be summarized as the three E's, which we use to guide implementation of innovation with digital technologies. The three E's are Excel, Extend and Explore. Excel means that we aspire to be an excellent port operator. Extend is about building an open ecosystem that includes upstream and downstream enterprises, customs and other government departments. Explore is related to sustainable development it means that by building on Excel and Extend, we can pursue model and business innovation to develop new business. Our 3 E's development plan has four pillars. The first is what we call automated terminal operations. Terminals work like factory production lines that are always on. The entire port is like a complete Industry 4.0 complex that houses a variety of technologies, including IoT, communications, automatic control, the Internet, cloud computing, AI, and even things like autonomous driving and remote control that you see on TV. All of them are used at automated terminals. 
Automated terminal operations have to meet several requirements. First, their technologies come in sets and have to be applied at scale. Second, these technologies come combined based on predefined orders and processes that are designed to satisfy targets that were set, like low latency requirements. New operation mechanisms need to undergo large-scale, high-intensity production tests to prove they are stable before we can roll them out. These mechanisms cover everything from scheduling of entire plans to the execution of individual instructions. Information on our equipment, our business, and that of related companies all has to be obtained in real time, while execution information also needs to be transferred to machines and systems in real time. The production process is fully digital and all equipment and processes are visible. Machines, systems and people are seamlessly integrated. Computer algorithms, mathematical algorithms and models work together to realize smart scheduling and intensive production. After production is completed, we use big data regression analysis to examine the production process to see where improvement is needed and what to do better next time. We are proud to announce that this homegrown terminal system is the largest one in use in the world. The 21 gantry cranes we have at the Yangshan Phase 4 port can each handle 1,000 TEUs every 24 hours when working at full capacity, which is much more than what could be handled at a conventional port. What's more, we have visualized every move, every container, and every piece of equipment loaded or empty, which helps us to analyze costs. These digital achievements have laid a solid foundation for future digital operations at port operators. This data can help operators further improve their service efficiency and quality and also bring them more benefits. These results have also been analyzed to produce standalone components. The port of Shanghai is now upgrading its traditional operations into automated and semi-automated operations. We are applying all of these new readily available technologies to this process. We believe that automation of port production and operations will be a major trend in the future. Going forward, a variety of other technologies will be rolled out in ports, including IoT, mobile video analysis, radio frequency-based autonomous driving detection, intelligent scheduling, and remote control. The rollout of high-speed port networks and breakthroughs in alternative energy and AI applications will drive a range of business innovations. Huawei has been developing and implementing world-leading technologies like IT, lithium batteries, photovoltaics, and smart lighting for years. It provides a mature, reliable, and advanced industrial network for the construction and operations of Yangshan Phase 4 port. ELT, wireless technology, and computer technologies are being used to develop new best practices for large-scale, automated, and intelligent port applications. The Huawei Industrial Optical Network that we are testing right now has world-leading features like ultra-low latency, large bandwidth, and security and reliability. These technologies will boost our traditional remote control systems. Based on our experience and our scenario-based capabilities, technologies like edge computing, big data, and AI will be a real disruptive force for automated port production and operations. Ports in the future will be smart, green, high-tech, and efficient. After hearing from Shanghai, we're now going to travel to the world's largest inland port and the leading logistics hub in Central Europe, the port of Duisburg, Germany. Sascha Trept, head of corporate development and strategy for Duisport, outlines the port's digital transformation across three dimensions. Welcome everybody, my name is Sascha Trept. I'm head of business development and strategy here at Duisport, Duisburg Hafen AG. I was asked by Huawei to take part in um, this year's digital conference um, and we were asked to share our insights and thoughts uh, about our personal or corporate digital journey as much as uh, general insights uh, on the topic digitalization. I'm happy to do so. Thanks for the invitation. Um, before I focus on the topic digitalization, I think it's important that we zoom in a bit on uh, Duisburger Hafen AG, Duisport, the port of Duisburg, 
who we are, what we do, because this will put things in perspective in order for you to better understand why we chose a certain, uh, a certain path and uh, why we have certain struggles that we uh, encountered uh, throughout the way. Um, yeah, enjoy. And uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, questions to be asked. <laughs> All right, so uh, Port of Diceberg, who we are, what we do. Um, we're going to zoom in uh, in three steps in order for you to um, better understand our, our setting and setup. Um, firstly, uh, it's about our orientation within Europe and, and Germany. Um, Diceberg is located at a strategically very yeah, good, important uh, location. We are right uh, by two important rivers, uh, the River Rhine, which is the biggest, most important river within Europe, and the River Ruhr. Um, beyond that, we're located at the intersection of two very important uh, highway axes. It's the north-south axis within Europe, as well as the east-west axis. Um, and uh, Diceburg is located at the most important uh, rail junction within Europe. What's important to understand about, um, about Diceburg is that within a range of uh, 150 kilometers around or perimeter around uh, Diceburg, um, there's a very large population that can be reached. Um, we're talking about 30 million consumers, which uh, have a total of 600 billion uh, spending, powers, uh, spending power per year, in euros of course. Um, and there's about 300,000 companies uh, located uh, around Diceburg within this 150 kilometer radius. Second step of the zoom in is uh, the port of Diceburg itself. If you think about the port of Diceburg, when I thought about the port of Diceburg before I started working here, I would picture a port. Um, in the end, it's not like that. If you look at the, at the map of Diceburg, the port of Diceburg is actually a bit scattered around the city. Um, there's uh, three key areas that we um, yeah, do business in. It's the, the old original port of Diceburg, uh, which you can see in the, in the upper, right, upper right corner of the picture that you see in the presentation. Then in the lower, in the lower left corner, you have a couple of terminals, uh, as well as in the middle, there's a couple of terminals. So we have three distinct uh, port areas, so to say. Um, we are proud of the fact that um, in the port of Diceburg, we can basically serve all different kinds of needs uh, through our infra and superstructure. We have a total currently of eight container terminals. Um, we're going to build we, meaning uh, we as the port operator together with partners, we're going to build two additional terminals over the next year. So in the future, we have a total of 10 container terminals here in Diceburg. Um, beyond that, uh, we have four important shunting yards, which are um, serving the terminals, so focusing on the rail side. Um, we have uh, crane facilities, uh, different uh, handling facilities for liquids. Um, you see some specifications on the chart that is, uh, that is uh, displayed while I'm talking. So, um, as I said before, we are able to basically serve um, yeah, all different needs from different customers. Thirdly, um, looking at the company itself, uh, Duisburger Hafen AG or Duisport, as I'm always referring to, um, the uh, Duisburger Hafen AG is the owner and operator of, of the port of Duisburg. Um, we are more than 300 years old. Uh, the first reference can be traced back to um, 1716. So a couple of years back, we had our uh, 300th anniversary, a big, big celebration going on. Um, the Duisburger Hafen AG, the, the, the company as it is existing nowadays, uh, was founded at the beginning of the 20th century. And roughly 100 years later, at the beginning of the 21st century, um, the trademark Duisport was introduced to the market. And uh, this is the trademark that we are known um, as yeah, along or in, in the entire world. Uh, what's important to understand is that not all of the activities in the port are performed by us as a company. Therefore, um, the uh, operating revenue or the revenue that we as Duisport have on a yearly basis it is much lower as uh, you would expect if you look at uh, a total throughput of 4.2 million TU per year. Our uh, yearly turnover is roughly 300 million euros and we have um, around 1,400 people working for us, for our company, for the group uh, Diceport. Um, we're proud to say that um, roughly 50,000 jobs are directly and indirectly linked to our activities in the port of Diceburg. Plus, there's a yearly value creation of uh, roughly uh, 3 billion euros 
uh, by companies uh, that are uh, yeah, traceable to the port of Diceburg. Um, if you look at what we're doing, we used to claim that we are more than a port. If you um, look at the chart that is being uh, depicted here uh, while I'm speaking, um, on the right side you can see uh, four bubbles um, and they represent our core business segments. Um, you would expect of a port to have of course infra and superstructure um, as, as, as one of the, of the core segments that uh, the port is operating in. Uh, we do that, of course. We are developing the infrastructure and the superstructure here in Diceburg. But beyond that, we're also very active in, uh, in logistics services. So we have three distinct uh, business units that are covering uh, logistics services. We have a very general one um, that's also called logistics services, where um, uh, there's a couple of uh, topics that we offer, especially in the port of Diceburg. Um, that is being performed in that in that business segment, and beyond that, we have a packaging logistics unit and also a contracts logistics unit. Um, we are convinced of the fact that um, the combination of the of the infra and superstructure department together with the logistics services for our customers and our clients um, is one of the key success factors uh, why the port of Diceburg has has, has developed uh, as it has over the past years. Um, we're proud to say that uh, with a container throughput of 4.2 million TEU per year, um, we are not only Europe's biggest inland port, we are also amongst uh, the biggest uh, you know, the top 50 container ports worldwide. And here we're not talking about river ports, we're talking about sea ports and river ports. So um, if you looked at other countries in Europe, for example, France, the port of Diceburg would be the biggest port of the country, even though we're not located uh, on the shore side, but uh, by a river, the River Rhine, as I said before. Um, beyond being a port, and this is reflected, as I said before, in our, in our corporate structure, we're also um, one of the most important or even the most important logistics hubs uh, within Europe. We have um, over 1,500 hectares of logistics space. Uh, we have 2.2 million uh, square meters of covered warehouses that we offer uh, to our customers, um, which is also important for, for big, yeah, big corporations to actually settle here in the Iceburg and um, yeah, organize their logistics throughput through our, through our hub, the port of Iceburg. Um, another key success factor for us is our wide-ranging um, national, European and also worldwide, uh, worldwide logistics network. Um, from the port of Diceburg, we can reach over 100 destinations uh, worldwide with uh, more than 400 uh, weekly connections uh, via train uh, or barge. And if you then uh, also include uh, trucking into that equation, of course, um, the connections are unlimited. Um, so we always say that uh, through Diceburg you can connect to uh, entire, the entire Europe and far beyond that because um, as you might know or as I'm sure you know uh, the port of Diceburg is um, uh, very closely linked to the Belt and Road Initiative of our uh, Chinese uh, partners and uh, we are the most important um, transshipment hub uh, when it comes to China-Europe trains um, roughly a third of all trains that, that reach Europe um, pass through the port of Diceburg and uh, either have their uh, final destination in and around Diceburg or are uh, from here further transported and distributed um, within Europe. If you talk about the westbound traffic and if we turn it around uh, with respect to the eastbound traffic, then we would be the uh, most important pre-consolidation hub before the shipments actually uh, take their long journey towards China. Um, how do we do that? How, we, how do we set up our business? We are convinced that um, within logistics um, as, a, as a field, uh, you cannot perform by yourself. Uh, we have very yeah, different logistics setups, supply chains. Uh, therefore, what we do as a, as a hub, uh, I mean, the port of Diceburg is a, a location on the map. Um, we do partner up with, uh, very strong, um, with very strong partners from all over the world, plus we are focus on, focusing on international projects. Um, again, on the slides, uh, you, can, you can read, or on this specific slide, you can read um, about a couple of our partners. Um, uh, of course, we have uh, Chinese uh, logistics players like uh, Sinotrans or um, Costco. 
um, as well as China Merchant who are involved. Uh, and beyond that, we also have other international partners, like for example, PSA International or, or DHL. Um, what we do is we are convinced of the fact that um, in order to, um, yeah, to support the growth of the China-Europe um, rail traffic, we cannot only focus on what's happening within Dicebook. We also need to focus on um, things that are happening alongside the, the supply chain, alongside the, the transport chain on the way between uh, Dicebook and China. Uh, and therefore, we're engaged in a couple of different projects, um, um, usually terminal projects, where we are um, either uh, developing new projects or we are um, yeah, like building new, uh, new, new terminals or we are developing existing terminals. Um, a couple of these projects are also depicted on the slide. Um, so far or so much about uh, the port of Diceburg, about us as a company, um, Newsport, um, which is supposed to just put the next few slides into perspective, uh, as I said before. We'll now focus on digital transformation. If we look at digital transformation, the digital journey that we're um, currently undergoing, uh, of course, you need some yeah, point that, we're, that you're actually working towards. Um, we call it a digital vision. Um, and we thought about how to be able to break down this topic of digitalization into digestible pieces. And um, we have uh, created a digital vision, uh, which you see on the slide. Um, and this vision has uh, three dimensions, as I call it. Firstly, um, there's the, the, the most inward dimension is what we do as Diceport, as Duisburger Hafen, okay? so on a corporate level. What needs to be done for us as a, as a, as a company to um, yeah, digitize what we do, regardless of the fact that we are a logistics company, we could also be a, a shoe producer, for example. So it's the digitalization of our internal processes. The second dimension or the second sphere, and you can also think of it as, a, as an onion, we already talked about the center of this onion, the second sphere, the next layer, would be um, all the initiatives that uh, together with our partners we take at the port of Diceburg, so at the location here in Germany, uh, within the port community, things that need to be done in order to better facilitate information exchange and other things here at the port. And the, the third dimension, the third sphere or layer, um, is then uh, the layer of international supply chains. So it's a question of what we do with respect to digitalization um, within international supply chains, where, of course, the port of Dicebook only covers a part of this chain. So um, when you move through those dim dimensions or you, you, you take the onion approach and go towards the outer layer, uh, more and more other companies are being involved uh, and the less power or um, yeah, the less power we have, um, the less things we can uh, influence by ourselves without uh, engaging in, in projects with our, uh, with our partners. And this is why I said before that uh, partnership is part of our DNA. We are convinced that only with partners we can, we can thrive uh, and continue our, our growth. If you look at this, uh, at this picture, um, uh, with respect to the digital vision, uh, you see those three spheres, so to say, as platforms depicted there, and then you see um, uh, timelines, and individual projects are, are depicted by, 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 by smaller platforms on this, on this picture. And then you move, of course, from uh, short-term uh, topics to our actual digital vision within each of these uh, platforms. Um, what we have been doing very successfully over the past years is spicing up our own digital uh, initiatives and efforts uh, with uh, national and international startups. So, um, as I said before, we are a company that is 300 years old. Uh, of course, not all, all of our employees are 300 years old, and nobody is actually that old, but you can say that coming from the logistics industry, from a yeah, conservative industry, you can say that the approach towards digitalization by, by the people working with Induceport could be um, yeah, rather old fashioned. Um, and therefore what we do is we, we spice up our efforts with, uh, with ideas from, as I said before, national and international startups. Um, in order to attract startups to our company and our port community, we have established something that we call Startport. Startport is a um, international um, startup accelerator program 
um, and uh, through this program we've been uh, we've been able to um, attract those startups to work uh, to work with us to work with uh, the other players in the port community um, and of course we're not limited to start ports if uh, you are an international startup and you think you have uh, great ideas about um, how to uh, push the digital transformation of, of this port forward you can always um, you can always approach us um, we are uh, we're always happy when when startups do that and we also collaborate with um, international uh, venture capital funds who of course have a very have a wide radar um, of or have a yeah have a radar and the, and, and the wide picture of uh, of the national international startup um, scene so to say and also from there we're taking up impulses if we Zoom in on Startport. What do we do at Startport? Um, of course, Startport is a co-working space. We are organizing um, network uh, events. Uh, we coach our startups, um, either ourselves, ourselves, or um, through uh, partners that we uh, engage in this in this uh, Startport program. Uh, we provide a financial network. We do not finance those startups ourselves, but we do provide access to uh, venture capital funds in order for the for the startups to seek um, uh, financing but most importantly we do provide um, uh, yeah access to uh, our port community so what the startups can do is they can pitch their ideas to us uh, as much as to our um, yeah to the other companies within our port community and uh, if we're convinced of a, of a story the startup will be uh, will become a member of the of the Startport community and will have the chance to um, actually uh, prove uh, their business idea in in uh, real life um, uh, circumstances. And uh, this has been uh, very promising and successful over the past years. And we are very happy to to have all the startups on board and to also be uh, widening our our community um, in the future. Coming back to our digital vision, our digital transformation. We are currently working on a, yeah, on smaller tickets, but also on a couple of big tickets. If we look at uh, Duisburger Hafen AG as a company, um, one important topic is uh, business intelligence. It's the question of how do we make more sense of the, of the information, of the data that we have as a, as a company um, or that we have um, about the port community. So, um, we are we are actually pushing a very big project uh, with respect to to business intelligence. Um, if you look at the port community in Duisburg, um, there's a couple of examples that I would like to give to you or present to you. Is uh, firstly is the topic of rail gates. Uh, we have installed numerous rail gates um, around our terminals. So whenever a train passes through these uh, OCR gates, these optical recognition gates, um, pictures are being taken from the train, the wagon, the containers, which enables us to, to see damages, uh, to, to actually investigate whether maybe there was theft ongoing, maybe container doors are open, we can track and trace uh, certain container numbers. Um, so that's a very important and powerful tool. But again, uh, we cannot be successful if we only have rail gates at our facilities. We need rail gates all over different uh, terminal locations because then we can actually trace trains between those, those, those gates. Um, another important topic that we're currently working on is uh, the topic of the port community system. We want to provide our partners, our customers here at the port of Diceburg with a um, powerful platform um, that facilitates the information exchange between, um, between those players. Uh, if you look into deep sea ports, uh, port community systems have been, um, yeah, have been established over the past 20 years, basically in every big port, but it's a rather new thing for, for big inland, inland ports. Um, and uh, it's, it's being linked to the fact that, as I said before, we are a very heterogeneous um, place, so to say, in DICE, where we have numerous companies doing business here, and the information exchange is very important to organize the different logistic services that these companies do in order to, uh, in the end, please the end customer, um, who then hopefully decides to run uh, his or her supply chain through the port of DICE. Um, very interesting topic we're working on is um, promising ETA and ETP estimations, so estimated time of arrival, or even more importantly, 
the estimated time of pickup for containers in the terminal. We're working with respect to that project, for example, we're working together with a, with a German startup that is um, using machine learning and very powerful algorithms to um, be able to predict ETAs, um, not only in a way that they say, ah, okay, a train is, let's say, 200 kilo kilometers out of the port of Diceburg, and the average speed is 50 kilometers uh, per hour, therefore the train should arrive in four hours. No, uh, what we do is we incorporate different, um, yeah, different factors into this estimation together with the startup. Um, the weather, as much as slower traffic in front of the train, as much as construction areas, etc. So we have a, a powerful estimation of this uh, estimated time of arrival at Diceburg, um, already a couple of hours out of the arrival time. So uh, our terminals can work with this estimation in their, um, yeah, in their planning, in their short-term planning for the for the next couple of hours and shifts. Um, more importantly, besides the ETA, is from our perspective the ETP for volumes that end in Diceburg. So you need to know when is a container ready for pickup in the terminal. So it's not important for you to know when the train arrives at the shunting yard in Diceburg, no, then there's shunting going on, there's terminal uh, processes going on, and uh, there might be a couple of hours between the time of arrival in Diceburg and the readiness for the container to be picked up by the, by the customer. And this, again, if you don't know this time, there might be, for example, a truck coming, wanting to pick up the, the container for the, for the last mile, so to say, and the truck then having to wait for a couple of hours. It's idle time, and idle time costs money, which in the end uh, we want to avoid. Um, then a project that we are engaged in, um, it's a digital project, even though it's not a purely about digitalization is that we we want to open uh, a white label store on Chinese e-commerce platforms in order to um, provide to our German customers uh, a sales channel, an online sales channel into China. Um, of course, we will do the logistics for that, but uh, it's, it's new for us that we provide the sales channel also to, to our customers. We're setting this up. Um, it's a bit early to talk about it because, as I said, we're still in the ramp up phase. Um, but it's a project that we're proud of and that we're uh, pushing along, um, uh, yeah, along different levels of the organization. And then an ongoing and very important topic is the, um, yeah, I put it in parentheses, the data integration or the integration with our international partner network. Of course, whenever we yeah, link up with a new company to do business with them, um, uh, there needs to be um, yeah, uh, interfaces between our systems in order to efficiently exchange information and also reap the benefits of this collaboration on a, on a digital uh, front, so to say. Um, if you look into the future, uh, beyond the projects that we're currently engaged in, um, there's also a couple of things that we have planned. Um, I put uh, three of those uh, planned projects on the slide for you. Um, we are uh, planning to implement a terminal uh, slot management system here in Diceburg, where uh, we actually manage the, the time slots for trucks delivering or picking up containers to or from the terminals. And based on that, uh, we want to um, establish a very powerful traffic management system um, here in Diceburg, uh, because even though we we are heavily focusing on shifting traffic from road to rail or road to barges. There is, of course, truck traffic, and uh, truck traffic is interfering with, um, yeah, with the people living in Diceburg. So, because of that, and also because of climate reasons, of course, we're trying to um, to minimize the truck traffic. Uh, nevertheless, there is trucks being involved, and uh, we want to manage this traffic as as efficiently as possible within um, the city limits of Diceburg, but also within the federal state of Northern Westphalia that we are located in. Um, and then uh, last but not least um, on this slide, uh, I, I put an information on there about the planned project um, that we do together with the city of Diceburg um, to implement, implement a power, powerful 5G network um, uh, within the city limits, also then covering the port area. And as you know, uh, 5G then being the backbone technology, so to say, um, for a lot of different applications that can then be developed here in Diceburg on this very powerful information exchange or data exchange um, uh, module. Uh, this is something that we don't have yet, it's something that we're working on and uh, we're very happy to, to be doing that together with the city um, and together with a couple of partners. Uh, lastly, I would like to touch upon um, 
different challenges that we have encountered or have been encountering over the past years and some key learnings we took from that. Um, I always like to say with respect to digitalization, there is no one fits all approach. Um, it's basically learning by doing, you can say, or uh, we do something, we learn from it, and then we adapt our process for the, for the next step that we, that, we, that we take within this project, or if we replicate the project to a different project, we say, ah, we, we did something wrong there, uh, therefore we're going to change the, uh, the approach for the, for the next time. Um, key challenges. Um, yeah, first of all, there's a mindset problem. Uh, if you talk, I personally talk to uh, sometimes colleagues, but also other people outside my organization, and you propose to change something, um, there might be a mindset problem, uh, and, 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 and people respond to you, well, but uh, why do you want to change it? It's always been done that way, and we have been doing it successfully, so there is no need for change. Um, so that's a key challenge that has to be overcome. Um, secondly, uh, we perceive that, and with we, I mean my team and I who are focusing on these digital efforts, um, sometimes the wrong priorities. Uh, you go to operational units and you talk to them about potential changes with respect to or in light of digitalization. And of course, uh, they will sometimes respond, well, but my daily business is more important. I cannot talk about future about future changes, I need to focus on making money now now, in order for you guys to be thinking about digitalization. That's a true fact. But uh, what has always happened uh, throughout my entire career is that the same people at some point will show up at your, at your doorstep when they encounter a problem and then they need digitalization to happen overnight, so to say. And of course, this is impossible. So we need to prioritize digitalization yeah, early in the process in order to actually reap the benefits in the future. Then looking at, uh, at uh, logistics, uh, logistics is a rather low margin industry. Um, so per se, there is limited funds to spend. Plus, because of the fact that all of the different logistics players are operating on rather small uh, individual profit margins themselves, they try to keep as much information as possible to themselves because um, information uh, is somehow linked to um, USPs um, towards your customer, which is then linked to actually earning money in the end. So that's another mindset thing that has to be overcome. Information sharing doesn't mean giving up the USP. It doesn't mean um, stripping naked and making everything that I do as a company that earns me money transparent to other people. Um, no, sharing information is actually something that will reap the real benefits. Because if you look at, from my personal perspective, if you look at digital efforts, an individual company can only do so much. And then you kind of hit the ceiling. If you then want to um, yeah, reap benefits beyond that, that ceiling, um, uh, then, then you, need to start, you need to start sharing information with other partners, players around you in order to really yeah, digitize the supply chain and, 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 and creating additional benefits. Um, logistics beyond that is a complex system. Um, I've been talking about international supply chains spanning, for example, from uh, Chongqing, China to uh, Diceburg in Germany. Um, and once a supply chain is initiated, is set up, hopefully it will run rather smooth. So everybody's happy. and you don't want to really change a, a winning team, so to say. Uh, so there's very little room for error. If you want to introduce changes to supply chains, um, you need to be sure that things work right away. Because otherwise you will, lose, um, you will lose the trust of your partners into those changes or the trust of your own colleagues into those changes. So there's very little room for error. Which kind of is contradicting to new approaches, having new ideas, trying to or wanting to try out something new, being a startup. Of course, sometimes you do make mistakes and this is a key challenge because it's, uh, yeah. All right, and the last point uh, on, uh, with respect to key challenges is uh, budget constraints. Um, remember the fact of uh, Duisport making 300 million of uh, yearly revenues. Uh, and then the, the size of the problem or the, the size of the, of, the, of the task that we are facing with digitalization, um, so budget to spend versus size of the task, uh, uh, you need to really prioritize your spendings. Um, with respect to key learnings, uh, also a couple of things. Um, 
yeah, decide on your digital strategy. You need to know where you're, you're heading to. Uh, you should expect and accept roadblocks. Um, you will hit them, um, hit them, and then get them out of the way. Um, from our perspective, it's important to really focus on problems. So digitalization should solve problems that are there in the supply chain, because then there is a need for change. Um, from my perspective, you should think big, but start small. As I said, or I referred to before, you need to find the nucleus that you can build around. Um, uh, this also links uh, to, the, to the next point. You need to produce results fast. You need to make the change tangible for everybody to understand that things are happening and really producing benefits. Um, you should work with like-minded people. Um, I have not made the best experiences with uh, trying to change people. So um, if somebody, some organization, some person doesn't want to get involved, don't involve them. Uh, you need to convince them by linking back to the previous points, producing results. Um, then, of course, also important, you need to back up your digital strategy with a financial plan. So you need to involve your finance people internally and externally um, as early as possible in the process, because uh, upfront you will create investments costs. Uh, uh, this needs to be understood and planned for. And then later on, you hopefully reap the benefits. Um, and then what we like to do, and I think what's a logical thing to do, is uh, you should try to share risks and costs that are linked to projects by linking up to uh, or linking up with other companies and, and consortia. And uh, logistics is a field that um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to do so because you have the international supply chains, very little, a very small number of companies cover the entire chain. Therefore, you need to collaborate uh, in digital topics anyway, which should make it easier to, to actually adapt, uh, to actually uh, use this, this key learning for, for your own projects in the future. Well, that brings me to an end. Um, thank you very much for your attention and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Taking a global perspective, where does the maritime industry as a whole currently stand? What precisely are its digitalization needs now and in the future? Ben Chiga, member of the steering committee of the European Union recognized organization Mutual Recognition Group is about to tackle these questions head on. Hello everybody, my name is Ben Chi. I'm the general manager in Sweden, CCS. My office is based in Stockholm. Today it's my pleasure to be here to share with you guys our knowledge and experience in marine time industry in terms of digitalization transformation. First of all, I would like to simply take this opportunity to simply introduce our company, CCS. CCS founded in 1956. Our headquarters is located in Beijing, the capital city of China. And up to date, we have 120 plus offices across the world. In 1988, CCS became the International Association Classification Society, being as a full member. And in 1994, the highest CCS classification notation was incorporated into the classification clauses by International Underwriting Association. And in 1995, which might be the milestone year in our company history, CCS was granted uh, recognized organization status by both European Union and uh, IS USCT. Our company has the associate membership of some international NGOs in maritime industry, such as Intertango, Intercargo, the Baltic and the International Maritime Councils, etc. And our company also has the membership of some international technical bodies and the technical forums. CCS has been for many years actively to participating in the technical activities of IMO, IACS, in order to initiate developed maintenance the international maritime technical standards in continuously enhancing our voice and uh, influence internationally. With the objective of uh, safety, environmental protection, and uh, creating value for our clients and uh, societies. Our company provides a, a range of the ser services in the industry, such as uh, 
the shipbuilding, shipping, the shipping finance, insurance, and uh, ocean resources exploitation, the ocean scientific research, energy saving, and emission reduction, and also the risk management uh, and uh, evaluation, etc. And of course, being as a China-based company, we continuously assist the China authorities to develop their policies, regulations, national standards, etc. from the technical perspective. We have uh, plenty of uh, cooperation with the China Maritime uh, Authorities and also the Inland Water Transportation Agencies, such as uh, the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment, the Maritime Safety Authorities, uh, Water Transport Bureaus, etc. And up to October last year, 2020, CCS class the ocean going fleet has already exceeded 120 million in gross tonnage, nearly three times what it was in 2010, which is a very, very rapid increase. So now I would like to draw your attention back to today's uh, topic, uh, digitalization transformation. First, I would like to introduce uh, intelligent shapes. Somebody also call it a smart shape, autonomous shape, uh, unmanned, bright shape, whatever. What is intelligent shape on Earth? It's based upon sensors, communication, the web of things, internet, etc. Perceive and obtain the information and the data on not only shape itself, but also the ocean environment uh, and other stakeholders make use of uh, the computer-based uh, technology, the automatic control technology and the big data processing and analyzing technologies. Achieve the intelligent operation in terms of uh, ship navigation, ship maintenance, ship uh, management and the cargo transportation in order to have safer, more reliable, more economical, more environmentally friendly shape in comparison with those traditional shape. In the face of uh, intelligent waves in recent years, the international maritime community has already paid sustained attention to the development of the smart shape. First, IMO has already put maritime autonomous shapes high on its agenda and is creating applicable regulations. And then ISO has set up a special task force to start the drafting the standardization roadmap for the smart ship. And also the major classification society, including our company in the world, have already issued the rules and guidelines relating to the smart ship. Here you can see a couple of uh, rules and the, in, and the guidelines which our company has already developed and also has already published in public for use. Here you have some typical project examples of the intelligent shape in place by which we have already derived uh, uh, plenty of uh, expertise, experience, knowledge. Under the impact of uh, intelligent adjacent waves, today's human society is seeing unprecedented, innovative changes in work and uh, daily lives, which accelerated the integration, innovation, and uh, fusion of uh, various uh, intelligent uh, technologies. A Intelligent society will come soon as a more advanced form of society following the past uh, agriculture society, industry society, and also the current uh, information society. This intelligent society will grow into an extremely complex uh, intelligent ecosystem. So here I would like to say everybody needs to be ready to embrace the new era of the intelligent shapes, also the intelligent society. Next, I would like to introduce a new concept called blockchain-based data sharing platform. 
in the picture to the right of this slide, uh, you may say surrounding the ship in the middle, there are many stakeholders in maritime industry. Here we have the shipyard. We have the ship owner, we have the designer, we have the classification societies, we have the manufacturer, we have the authorities, service suppliers, and also various ports. So there are huge data resources in maritime industry, and it has been gradually recognized that uh, effective multi-party data sharing will surely promote the digital and uh, intelligent transformation and accordingly upgrade our industry. The only question left to us is how? How are we going to share the data in this format? There are some difficulties facing the multi-party data sharing. First, the data ownership protection. How to define and determine the ownership of data and protect their right and interest? Second, is data dissemination control how to prevent the secondary spread of the data and protect IPR of the data owners. And the third one is about the value of the data. The value of data has been increasingly widely recognized, but there is a tendency to prefer to use other people's data rather than provide ourselves. What if we collect all the data from different uh, stakeholders and uh, simply just uh, throw them into uh, the big barrel of data which is called a centralized database. Is this approach working? No, I don't think so. There are some problems to be solved. The system construction cost would be very high and the data collection is difficult. The data ownership are difficult to be identified distinguished, let alone to be protected, and the data submission is very slow, not timely. The data quality is difficult to be guaranteed, and the data usage varies from company to company without common format and standard. So here, more or less, we may conclude that simply applying centralized database is not going to work well. Recent years, the various blockchain technologies were introduced to our societies, such as uh, distributed uh, storage, consensus mechanism, the smart uh, contract, etc. In light of those uh, new technologies, together with other cooperators, CCS initiated a new concept, the blockchain-based data sharing platform in maritime industry with the following features and uh, methodologies. First, the data is to be autonomously controlled, separately controlled, not centralized. Second, the data common standards are to be developed, formulated. The data sharing requires authorization by respective data owners, and the data uses can be cheesed. In case such kind of data sharing platform has already been established in place, there must be many meaningful, useful applications. Among those, I would like to uh, highlight this one called uh, Emergency Response Service. CCS has already been for many years providing ERS for more than 700 ship owners operators, which more than 2,000 vessels in order to save lives when the accident uh, happens at sea and uh, in land water as well. Imagine, we will be able to provide the ERS much more rapidly, much more efficiently, if we have such blockchain-based data sharing platform in place in seamless collaboration, cooperation with other stakeholders. This means uh, as a, a outcome we may be able to save more lives in time. Next section, I would like to present uh, some new applications, data-driven trend in the field of uh, sweep survey based on the new technology and the new equipment. First, it's called the uh, inspection drone application, which adapted to the 
special marine time environment of no satellite signal, no light, strong electromagnetic interference. The ship inspection zone is too big with the intelligent sensing and also the autonomous uh, obstacle avoidance function. Next is called a 5D plus uh, ship remote inspection. In order to implement uh, such kind of uh, remote inspection, without the need of surveyor embarking on board the vessel, which is uh, quite meaningful, especially during the pandemic period of time. We need first the real-time remote inspection platform, and then we need VR equipment. And the third one is called the uh, image recognition of ship uh, structure defects. We are going to establish a set of images of a typical ship structure and uh, typical the structure defects. Then we are going to develop uh, the target detection algorithm models. The fourth one is called the uh, VR panoramic ship. Uh, the virtual reality panoramic ship for remote ship survey training purposes and other purposes, etc. Challenges, yes, we always have challenges everywhere. In particular, speaking of the digitalization transformation, the cybersecurity is always there as a stress. We need the cybersecurity solutions. We also need to do the risk assessment uh, for the cybersecurity. In addition, we need to know how to test and uh, verify the cybersecurity level. Digitalization transformation in maritime industry requires not only innovation and uh, breakthroughs in technical aspects, but also we need to address law, legislation, regulation, policies, social issues. To this end, Close international multi-party cooperation is needed among those government authorities, classification societies, ship designers, owners, builders, insurers, ship investors and ports, etc. to jointly build an uh, international intelligent maritime ecosphere. Thank you very much. That's all for my speech today. Thank you for your time and uh, attention. Illport Holding is ranked as the 12th biggest terminal operator in the world according to a 2017 ranking compiled by the independent maritime research consultancy Drury. Let's hear from the company's chief information officer, Mark Wooten, on his experiences implementing container terminal automation. Hi, everyone. Good day. I'm very honored to be presenting at this event. My name is Mark Witten. I'm the Chief Information Technology Officer for Yulport Holding. Yulport is a Turkish international terminal operator with a head office in Istanbul. We have operations in 10 countries in Latin America, Iberia, the Nordics, Mediterranean, as well as in Turkey. The company is currently ranked number 12 on the Drury list of international terminal operators and has a goal to be in the top 10 by 2025. Today I will be discussing automation in ports. Firstly, there should be a good business case for the investment in automation. This could be through improvements in efficiency, increased productivity, reduction in costs, as well as increased or improvements in safety and security. Areas that are typically looked at for automation include the engineering and technical space, where we could look at environmental and sustainability improvements, augmented workforce for safety and security of our employees, in the operations and cargo handling equipment, on the key side for lashing and twist lock handling, as well as in process improvements for vessel call optimization, charging and invoicing, and planning. What do we see as typical challenges that we experience when implementing automation and digitization? These would be security, safety, scalability, device and sensor management, data ownership, and also data quality. At Yieldport, we have already invested in automated systems for gait and crane OCR, automated steering and anti-collision, as well as automated warehouse management. We have projects currently in progress for implementation of automated yard cranes, 
building an invoice process automation, and also investigating the use of autonomous trucks in our terminals. What will the digital terminal of the future look like? First, it will be enabled by smart containers, smart people, and equipment. Secondly, it will be represented by a digital twin using artificial intelligence and machine learning. The collection of large amounts of real-time data will only add value to the business through its contribution to automated decision-making and optimization. In order to make this happen, it will need to have a secure and redundant communication layer for all devices and trading network partners. Always up, always on. It will also need to have standards for interoperability. For our industry, these are currently being developed by the Digital Container Shipping Association, focused more on the shipping side, and the Terminal Industry Committee 4.0, or TIC 4.0, which is a combination of terminal operators, equipment manufacturers, and software suppliers, focused on creating a common language and standards for the industry that will make digitization and automation projects more accessible and affordable for the industry as a whole. In closing, a few points that need to be considered when implementing automation as much as any other technology. Firstly, implementing the system is just the beginning. What that means is that the system requires ongoing support and fine tuning and improvement. It is not a once-off investment, but something that will continue beyond the initial project. As much as there is pressure through increasing vessel sizes on terminals, we also have pressure on suppliers to scale down their solutions to fit all types and sizes of businesses, not just the mega terminals with large budgets. And finally, like all projects, company culture and proper change management are critical to the success and achievement of the project and business objectives. Thank you very much. Now evolving into a new fifth generation, how can ports derive benefit from the application of artificial intelligence and 5G? Huawei Transportation Solutions architect Tiago Pinto has some answers. Hi, my name is Tiago Pinto and I belong to the Europe Transportation Competence Center which belongs to the Huawei Transportation Business Unit. Today's conference is about digital transformation and how it is impacting different sectors such as the port industry. In this session, you will learn how new ICT technologies can help ports to shift into the new generation. First of all, let's see what are the common challenges that ports face today and what are the main trends in this domain. Ports are a country's gateway for import and export trade and serve an important role to efficiently feed the hinterland rail and the ca truck cargo infrastructure. As such, they are key for the country's economic development. In one hand, the port needs to improve its operational efficiency by focusing on the flow of ships, cargo and trucks to become more competitive in its area by attracting more ships and routes and improve the supply of goods. This pressure in the logistics industry has become more evident during the last year with the exponential growth of the e-commerce due to the pandemic. On the other hand, the port is an important environment where we have multiple roles. It is then necessary to improve the cooperation among all parties, streamline the information flow and improve both foreign and domestic trade logistics. So, ports are intermodal systems involving ships, trucks and trains that will benefit greatly from automatization once data silos between the various stakeholders are taken down. The improvement in safety, efficiency and experience is achieved through technology innovation. Huawei is cooperating with numerous ports to build a cloud and AI-based system to make the port operator as the single interface to different stakeholders, like cargo owners, shipping companies, warehousing companies, etc. This way, the port becomes the hub for the cargo operation and management process and can control the service quality to cargo owners in order to become more competitive. But where are we currently in this process? 
digital transformation has become a mega trend worldwide where more than 170 countries have already established strategies for digitalization, 5G and AI. And the port industry is, of course, no exception. We have many examples of ports investing on new ICT technologies to improve their efficiency, optimize their processes and allow new business models. However, this shouldn't be done as isolated procurement acts for individual technologies, but rather as part of well-defined strategic plans with established mid- and long-term objectives. This is the reason why we see countries and regions defining and promoting innovation and digitalization strategies to motivate all industry sectors and players to develop their own plans. Huawei works closely with its ecosystem, including customers and partners, and has been involved in some innovation and digitalization initiatives worldwide. So, what kind of tools can port managers and operators use to build their new generation port operations? A port is a complex environment with diverse stakeholders, different processes and operations. Ships coming in, the cargo unloading, the complexity to know where a container is at a specific time of the process and the overview of the all operations can be quite challenging. Additionally, to the number, large number of individual tasks in a port is the high interdependency between them, meaning that a single abnormal event has a ripple effect across the whole process and ultimately affects the reliability and efficiency of the port operation. In this picture, I try to summarize the main areas and some of the innovative solutions that Huawei has already available to support digital transformation, ranging from comprehensive security and process automation to the holistic management and port operations at the IOC, connected by the new generation of wireless technology. There's a variety of building blocks that help customers to pave their own path towards digitalization. The goal is that high-risk and difficult operations are handed over to intelligent equipment, which improves efficiency and reduces labor usage. The implementation of an end-to-end -end integration of core business, the visualization of the operation management and the port process reorganization is the path to increase the service quality and to become more competitive. To give some examples, let's have a look at the four solutions highlighted in the picture. To implement equipment remote control or automatic vehicle operation, it is necessary to transmit multiple video feeds and to have a ultra-fast communication to ensure that control commands are delivered in a timely manner. In the last two decades, there have been ports who gave their first steps to control cranes remotely and start automatizing the operations. However, the technologies available at that time didn't cope with the required features. Fixed communication networks weren't flexible to adapt to a mobile environment or to the existing infrastructure. Wi-Fi technology didn't have the latency required for a smooth, precise and reliable crane operation. Only 5G can ensure the high bandwidth, low latency, wide coverage and high mobility required for the port automation. Huawei has been working closely with ZPMC, the world's largest port equipment manufacturer and system integrator, to deploy several 5G-based remote control ports. In addition to crane remote control and AGV, other innovative applications including intelligent video surveillance, drone inspection and remote AR assistance are being implemented to help improving the port operation efficiency. The gate of the container wharf is an important business link for container and over, document processing and information recording between wharf and trailer.
The Intelligent Gate solution combines advanced technologies such as OCR, CCTV, LED and real-time control. The core command system controls the operation of each element based on the surface process. When a truck arrives at the gate, it automatically identifies the vehicle license plate and the container identification number and then, due to its real-time interaction with both terminal management system and the customs information platform, based on the operational requirements, it triggers all actions related to gate control of the container terminal. Huawei has deployed a similar solution in the Middle East, where the checkpoint release time was shortened from 3 to 5 minutes down to 10 to 20 seconds. But keeping track of container location and movement in the terminal is essential for a smooth and efficient port operation. Using CCTV together with OCR and AI, we can track the containers in real time from the moment they are unloaded from the ships till they exit the terminal by truck or train. Additionally to their positioning, it is also possible to monitor their condition and detect damage in a container, which allows to raise an alarm so that measures can be taken. This feature is increasingly important as we shift to automatic operation, where containers are moved by AGVs. In this case, the machine vision replaced the human eyes, with the ability of monitoring all cameras at the same time, all the time. One important piece of the puzzle is the Intelligent Operations Center, which is the core of the port operations. It combines the operation monitoring and control, as well as the dispatching center. Moreover, the IOC is also an assistant to the decision-making of the port. Based on Big Data Platform, where all things are sensitive and connected, it contains all the port's operation process and displays all the information in a panoramic view, containing dashboards and real-time videos. This way, it is possible to have an holistic view of the business of the individual processes and take assisted actions when necessary. Another crucial aspect is port security. It is a harsh environment with several tons of cargo being moved, with valuable goods being handed, which raises several risks, damages in equipment or cargo, accidents or injuries with workers, thefts, among others. This is the reason why it is important to have a security solution that goes beyond the traditional video surveillance system. Only with an accurate, intelligent and linked system combining video, AI and big da data digital platforms connected by state-of-the-art communication networks, we can assure port security, early detecting abnormal situations and triggering an important response to events. The IOC is like a big eye powered by a big brain to improve port operation and security. Let me share a successful case with Shanghai SIPG port who already shared their experience in today's session. They are the largest container port ranking number one in the world for 11 consecutive years and they run seven terminals. Huawei is the main ICT supplier of Shanghai Port Group and has especially contributed to the full automation of Yangshan Port Terminal 4 thanks to LTE and 5G, which meets the latency required for full automation. The efficiency of Yangshan Port Terminal 4 has been increased by 30% and the work staff in the terminal has been reduced by 85%. Nowadays, the Terminal 4 of Yangshan Port has no more staff people in the yards. Additionally, Huawei is also piloting with Shanghai Port Group for the full unmanned operation of the port at group level involving seven terminals with technologies such as networking, data center, cloud and 5G. In Europe, an increasing number of ports 
are also adopting 5G and AI as part of their digital transformation course. At the port of Algeciras, Huawei was involved in a pilot project to modernize and optimize the management and security systems thanks to the usage of augmented reality and 5G, video streaming in real time and advanced assistance allowing a faster response time by the port agents. The port of Barcelona also leveraged on Huawei's 5G and AI potential to implement a solution that will offer information on vessel location to implement the data provided by the identification systems currently used by the control tower. The port of Barcelona will also share their experience in the digitalization journey in the session. In case you are interested in learning more about Huawei's innovative solutions, please check our website or don't hesitate to contact me. I'll be happy to support you. Thank you for listening and stay tuned. And with that, we've come to the end of our exploration into port development. Thank you for lending us your time today. I look forward to seeing you next time.